What about that enormous patriarchal phallus, then? That was very impressive. If that opening salvo didn't give you a hint as to where you've ended up, we advise that you buckle up since our filled examination of Bo is afraid. To put it mildly, this third film from writer-director Ari Aster is a strangely intriguing and equally insane experience. While there are many jokes to be made about how it regularly dicks around, the ending itself is worth exploring in depth since it is a beast unto itself. This movie leads us to areas that make his earlier films in Midsommar appear like a stroll in the park for its protagonists, whereas his earlier films in Midsommar were frightening but generally simple in how they all wound up. Particularly, Bo, the disturbed man, has had a significant change in his life. The movie follows the character, played by Joaquin Phoenix, as he braves the world beyond his flat, is gravely hurt after being hit by a car, wanders through the forest, and learns that his entire journey to his mother's house was based on a lie. He believed that said mother Mona, who was brilliantly brought to life by Patty Lupone, had perished in a tragic accident involving a chandelier, but she is really still very much alive. When Bo was having sex with his childhood sweetheart Elaine, who passed away as the climax approached, he learned this unfortunate information. This came as a surprise because he had been warned as a youngster that if he ever attained this level of pleasure, he would perish. As soon as this switch is made, Mona tells her son who she is and that she has been keeping an eye on him all along. It turned out that all the individuals he encountered along the road were watching him and filming everything he did. Bo also discovers that his previous dreams were all true, and that his twin brother was truly imprisoned in the attic along with their father, who is literally a huge monster of a penis, still following along. Put a pin in this for now, this is only the appetizer to the main meal. Making a case for everything furious that he has been misled, Bo proceeds to choke his mother. She is still coughing when he finally wakes up, and she collapses through a piece of furniture. Bo swiftly leaves the house in a stupor after being shocked by what he had done, his face frozen in terror. Then, after finding a speedboat and using it to travel down a tunnel to get there, he finds himself in some type of stadium. Not only is his mother present, also raised from the dead, but he is also being watched by a crowd. A trial starts with Bo stranded in the water. It is a show that explores all of his numerous shortcomings. Dr. Cohen, a family friend who he had only spoken to via phone conversations, but who is now ripping Bo apart, is prosecuting him and is portrayed by Richard Kind in remarkable form. Comparatively speaking, his defense counsel is little, barely able to raise his voice high enough to be heard before being hurled to his death onto the rocks. Bo is almost certainly guilty in this stage trial. As the titles roll, the boat is turned upside down, with him probably dying inside it. The audience then disperses, seemingly disinterested in the entire situation, with little fanfare or climax other than death to signal that this is the outcome everything has been building to. It is nearly anticlimactic. With that said, it should be stated that the movie is essentially a parody. He has produced an absurdist comedy that is braided into an existential horror show to expose the flaws in one guy. This character's name is Bo, and he has a lot of problems. Putting that pin back in place, it is obvious that the movie is about how failures in life may add up to a weight that is too big to carry. Bo may be Astor inventing a persona based on his own deeply held concerns, according to one interpretation. This is what I'll refer to as the mommy issues hypothesis, with all the simple references to Freud or other wide uses of psychotherapy that can be made. In light of this, the most intriguing concepts emerge when we disregard this and consider everything, including Papa Penis, to be mere window decoration for the subject that interests Astor the most his interaction with the audience. We're most afraid of Bo and Aster. There is no relief from Bo's misery as he reaches the end of the path. Even though nothing truly was done, he underwent what might nearly be considered a typical hero's journey, which included leaving his flat by literally crossing a threshold. Bo is forced to reflect on what he has accomplished up to this point, but he does not do it alone. Instead, a group of strangers will now have the opportunity to analyze and pick apart each step he made to get there. Whether Bo is intended to be a literal representation of Astor or not, every artist leaves a piece of themselves when they create. After that, every choice they make is scrutinized and dissected. This particular composition is an example of that since it dissects the actual occurrences to reveal their underlying themes. Astor bows before the crowd as Bo is subsequently destroyed, unable to fight back against all that is being thrown at him. There is something really unsophisticated about this finale, despite the fact that many people have hurried to label the movie as pompous, labeling it as excessive when it is far more controlled than that. In this case, the final image speaks for itself. It's noteworthy that we are left to watch the crowd leave in an uninterested manner, as if they didn't really care about what transpired. The plot continues even after the death of the familiar character. Everyone that participated in it, including us as the audience, are acutely aware of how they will go on in their own lives. For three hours, the audience watched as Astor's mind was revealed to us, just as Bose was shown to the assembled people. The process culminated in the destruction of the latter, whose repercussions the movie continues to explore. This annihilation does not include a painful rebirth or resurrection like in Midsummer or Hereditary. Instead, it has a sense of closure, which is Astor's admission that whatever he puts out there may be forgotten and dead to the numerous audience members who will leave the room without giving it further thought. 
It acts as a last-ditch effort to face fear. This devastation brings a desolation, whether it be of judgment of one's work, life, or a mixture of both. No matter how much one gives of themselves to tell a wonderful narrative, there is always the dismal possibility that you'll be left to drown, as Bo himself imagined in graphic detail halfway through. Thanks for watching, and if you're new to channel subscribe and click the bell, so you don't miss out latest videos of Media Breakdown.